beautiful ladies and handsome men. I am not sure what's true or false in this story. I take gossip, tea, rumor, and scandal from yesteryear, from online, from word of mouth, from books, and I ball it up and I tell you guys a story. Now, let's get to it. Hi everybody, this is Ashley with Ashley Says So and Scandalites and Says So Squad. Did y'all leave the room after the Mom's Maybelline video? Because if so, come on back into the doggone room. It's time for the part two video, Miss Gladys Bentley. Let's get to it. Gladys Alberta Bentley was born on August the 12th, 1907 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Her father's name was George L. Bentley and he was an American man and her mother's name was Mary Moat and per gossip, she was Trinidadian. And outside of Gladys, this couple had three more children, but Gladys was the oldest. And baby, once again, put your helmets on and trigger warning because just like mom's story, the uh, mess starts early with this one too. In fact, Gladys Dangone scandal starts so doggone soon, she was still a newborn. Baby, word on the street say that when Gladys' mother pushed her out, all of the nurses in the hospital were crowding around and they lifted up Gladys and they were like, oh, here you go, Miss Mary, here's your daughter. Honey said that they couldn't even get the word daughter out because when they looked at Mary, she was sitting on the bed with her arms crossed, frowned up. Said one of the nurses was like, uh, what's wrong with you? Tama, I know y'all finna say she a doggone daughter. I didn't want no little girl. I wanted a little boy. I needed me a son. Said the nurse was like, oh, okay. Well, you may have wanted a son, but this here is a daughter, your daughter. Baby said they tried to go ahead and hand Gladys to Mary. Mary wouldn't take the baby. And allegedly, this situation got even worse when Mary took Gladys home from the hospital. Said that the woman straight up rejected the child. Would and pick the child up when she was crying, do no kind of bonding or nothing, said that Mary wouldn't even uh, nurse Gladys. And okay, you may not want this child sucking from your boob, but the least you could do is give this baby a doggone bottle. Baby said that uh, Mary wouldn't even do that. Said that the only way Gladys did get fed is because her grandmother came over and would feed her. Baby, think I'm lying. The folks is out here saying that Mary sat up in that doggone house, frowned up for six doggone months before she even picked up her child. Got Gossip claims that even though Gladys was a newborn baby, allegedly this child still felt this abandonment. Like the trauma was so strong of her mama like rejecting her. Um, allegedly, like I said, she felt this abandonment as a baby and certainly when she became a toddler. Here's the thing though, if Gladys thought she had been rejected as a baby, she must have felt like a doggone two-headed alien by the time she became a child and teenager because the rejection that she would face then was so much more. And that's because when Gladys had become school aged, one morning out of the blue, she woke up and instead of putting on the dress that had been laid out for her, she put on one of her brother's suit. Baby, that girl walked out in front of her family and her parents didn't know what to think. They actually thought that she was confused. You know what I'm saying? So they were like, you know, no, you need to wear the dress. Those suits are for your brother. Gladys wore a dress that day, but every day after that for the next week, Gladys put on one of her brother's suits and snuck out of the house and went to school. And when they saw how determined their daughter was to dress up as a guy, this is when her parents realized that, you know, they had a problem or what they thought was a problem. This so-called problem would become even more of an issue because at school, Gladys had something else going on. And that was a major crush on her elementary school teacher. She would find all type of reasons to be the teacher's helper, you know, or she would want to stay after school. And when she did, uh, she would be brushing her teacher's hair and rubbing all through it. And when her parents get an inkling that their daughter is attracted to other females, let alone her teacher, you know what I'm saying? When they get the inkling of this, immediately they're telling her, no, 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 this is wrong. You're supposed to be attracted to the males like this boy. You know, you're gonna grow up, you're gonna get with a guy and you're gonna marry a guy. And although Gladys would listen to them and she probably would kind of agree with them, this would depress her to no end. The thought of being with a guy would make her sick. She didn't like boys in any way and she didn't even like her brothers as a matter of fact uh, rumor has it she hated her brothers now Gladys didn't understand why at this point but as we get further into the story you'll find out why she hated her brothers but at this point she didn't understand it all she knew is that anything male related 
it just was not it for her. So all the way up until uh, when she was a teenager, she was wearing male clothes. Her parents were exasperated. They didn't know what to do. And so they signed their daughter up to go see multiple doctors. Like they felt like she needed to be cured of this illness that she had. And these visits were torture for Gladys. And even more than that, they were devastating for her because they let her know that her parents would never accept her. You know what I'm saying? That they would continue to send her to these doctors to try to cure what they thought was something that was wrong with her. But what she knew was just her. And so she felt like her parents would never accept her. Not only this, now that she was an actual teenager, she was going to school and the students around her were ridiculing her. They were making fun of her. You know what I'm saying? You dress like a boy, you know? So she pretty much felt like a freak show at home and at school. So when she got to the age of 16, Gladys decided that this was enough. You know, she wasn't accepted here in her community, in her home. She she was going to go somewhere where it was more free and she'd read magazines and newspapers constantly and there was only one place that she felt like she could go and everything would be accepted you know or at least more accepted there than it was here and that was New York not only had Gladys seen the freedom of New York she also saw all of these stars that came out of New York all of these Broadway stars and that is where Gladys went she showed up at the office of a Broadway agent this agent allowed her to audition for him and so she played a few songs for him. He was so impressed that he asked her to cut eight sides of a record for him and he paid her $400 for this. Gladys could not believe her luck. If her music was this great that somebody had paid her this to cut an eight-sided record, then uh, Gladys was wondering what kind of money she could make if she performed. You know what I'm saying? How much money could she make a night? How much money could she uh, make a week? And she could not have landed in New York at a better time because the year was 1920. And a couple of years before, there was a club named Connie's that was located in Harlem, New York, that advertised that they were looking for lesbian entertainers. And if you want to know the backstory of why they were looking for lesbian entertainers at this club called Connie's, please go and watch the Mom's Mabley video. Anyways, Gladys goes to Connie's and they do hire her, but their major star at this time is Mom's Mabley. So it's kind of hard for her to stand out at Connie, which means she was not making as much money as she felt like she could make. So soon she started to look elsewhere trying to see who else was hiring. And that's when one of her friends came and told her, hey, I know an opening. And Gladys was all hyped like, you know, where girl, where? Then her friend gonna say, Harry Hansberry's Clam House. And I believe the friend was meaning this in a joking way because Harry Hansberry's uh, Clam House put out specifically that they were looking for a male piano player because the Clam House was a gay speaker easy for male. So the friend was probably like, you know, girl, I'm just kidding. You gotcha. know what I'm saying? You can't work there. They want a man. Gotcha. Well, this would be another moment in Gladys Bentley's life that showed that she did not play by the rules, honey. Baby, a couple of days later, Gladys put on one of her finest suits slicked her hair all the way back. Matter of fact, put on a hat for good measure. When she was done fixing herself up, she looked in the mirror and she saw the male pianist that this clam house was uh, requesting. She marched right on down to this speakeasy and told them that she was the man that they were looking for. And Gladys had the male persona so down pat that at first the owners really thought this was their guy. They told her to get on stage and play a song for them. And this is when they got their first inkling that something wasn't right. Gladys sang in a very deep vocal tone, but there was a feminine twang that she just could not get rid of. So soon, one of the owners called Gladys out for not being a man. And Gladys gets all huffed up in the chest, you know, say, man, what you talking about? The owner goes on, clearly, ma'am, you are a woman. Here go Gladys. Man, say what? No, clearly I'm a man. Allegedly, they go back and forth for a little while before the owners start to get frustrated. And this is when Gladys was like, okay, okay, you know. But man, I'm good, I need this gig. And so that's when the owner is like, you know what? Just play for tonight because we need you anyway. So please play for tonight. And then after that, we'll see how this thing goes. Well, Gladys does play that night and she plays so well that her little bucket or bowl is overflowing with tips. So at the end of the night, when Gladys went to go see the owners, they basically were like, you know what? We actually feel like we can do something with this. Like we actually can make this work and put on a show. So we're gonna hire you for $35 per week. Gladys agrees to this offer and her smile is like a mouth 
why? Because see, now she is the in-house entertainment. Now she could put on her own show exactly like she wanted to, and she would be the first lesbian female to do it at this club, the same way Mums Mabley was the first female to do it over at the Cunny Club. So the first thing Gladys does is comes up with a new stage name. She wants everybody to call her Barbara Bobby Minton. After that, she works on creating her persona. And one of the main parts of this persona would be the clothes that she would wear, the tuxes that she would wear. In particular, this beautiful white tuxedo that she would wear. Baby, this thing was definitely the talk of the town. It had the stiff collar, it had the small bow tie, the Oxfords, she had the short Eton jacket. This outfit alone already set Gladys apart. But the main thing she brought to the table was her music. She truly wanted her act to stand out. In order to do this, she had to create music that would really catch people's attention. So Gladys would take nice little bubblegum songs, usually written by white artists, and then she would put this really, really dirty twist on them. Like for instance, she would take the song called My Man by Fanny Bright. Whereas Fanny's song would say something similar to uh, my man, two or three girls he has besides me, I still can't let him go. I don't know why. Gladys's version would be, my man has two or three girls besides me, but I ain't letting him go because the way he tickles my TT, ooh wee wee. You know, and like that wasn't one of her lyrics, but what I'm saying is, do you see how she put her own uh, nasty twist on there? Well, this is the type of stuff that Gladys did. She would also sing songs talking about sissies and bull daggers, as she called them. Please, I'm not trying to offend nobody, but as she, uh, that's the way she talked, you know what I'm saying? And when she did this, she would say stuff to her gay male audience. Stuff like, you know, you sissy over there, come here and bring a girl with you. Then you go back over there and leave the girl here because I ain't never had a sticking, but I sure wouldn't mind a good licking. <laughs> child. As you can imagine, all of this stuff was a scandalous thing, child. But as much talking and yapping and stirring that it caused, nobody was really mad at what she was saying. Instead, word was spreading all around town and people were falling over themselves trying to get to her next show. And soon, the Clam House Speakeasy Club went from having a mostly gay male audience to a mostly gay male and female audience to a mostly gay male and female and straight male and female audience. Pretty much meaning everybody was now coming to this club to see Gladys Bentley. And soon her pay went from $30 a week to $125 a week. She was such a sensation that the club owners wanted everybody to know that Barbara Bobby Minton was their singer. So they renamed the club after her. Uh, the club ended up being named Barbara's Exclusive Club. And uh, very soon she was about to get her biggest offer yet. And that was to work at the Ubunji Club on Park Avenue. Now not only was Gladys performing for gay and straight people, she also was performing for white people, black people, heck, sometimes even Hispanic people. And of course, all of this exposure amongst different club goers made Gladys Bentley a star. And baby, now that she was a full-blown star, the layout of her performances changed. Now she was performing with a full-blown gay male chorus behind her. She'd do a call and response with them, you know what I'm saying? She'd say things and then she'd be like, so what do you say, gay boys? And then they'll do some kind of holler and response back to her. Just a good time. By this time, Gladys was making so much money, not only was she acting like a star, she was now living like one. Honey, she had a penthouse apartment on Park Avenue, was paying upwards $300 a month. Not only that, she hired multiple servants, and she also had multiple beautiful cars with paid chauffeurs to drive her around. She splurged, baby. Not only did she splurge on herself, she splurged on the many girlfriends that she had. But there was this one girlfriend that became Gladys's absolute fave and this lady's name was Beatrice Robert. It's claimed that she met Beatrice sometime in 1929 and by the time 1930 got there uh, Gladys was so enthralled with this lady that uh, Beatrice moved in with Gladys and it really seemed like this relationship was going to be long term because as far as everybody could tell Gladys wouldn't even let Beatrice out of her sight. But then child Gladys's sight saw white baby and Beatrice disappeared like a thief in the night and no I am not talking about Gladys's 
this famous white tuxedo. I'm talking about the cute white dancer she met that made her drop Beatrice like Beatrice was a doggone bad habit. Honey, I told you that she had moved Beatrice into her house in the year of 1930. Well, baby, by the year 1931, Beatrice was gone and Gladys was with this showgirl and was absolutely in love with her new woman. So much so that she married this new woman. And this was not no hush hush affair, honey. No, ma'am. Gladys made this a very public affair. And honey, you know them tongues got to wagging, baby. Because uh, not only were two women getting married in a super public uh, ceremony, one of those women were white. So the folks were talking, but Gladys didn't give a dang, baby. Whitey Poo was her boo. And that was that. Gladys settled right into married life, ready to enter entertain, make money, and show her new boo a good time. But sadly, child, the tee hee hee was floating around in the atmosphere, just waiting to land on Gladys's doggone head. And this is when I need y'all to really listen up, because in order to explain what this tee hee hee was, I need to uh, go deep on y'all. So as we all know, Gladys Bentley is now a very famous lesbian performer. She has performed for Cesar Romero, Cary Grant, Barbara Stanwyck, and many, many more. But this fame that she has is an underground fame. This is not the same fame as somebody like Cab Calloway or Duke Ellington, Josephine Baker, people like that. Those people were known to the greater public. Gladys Bentley, being a lesbian performer, was known to the underground crowd. Most of the clubs that she performed at were speakeasy clubs. These themselves were underground places. Speakeasies came up because America started prohibition in the 1920s. And prohibition was the outlaw of the sale of alcohol. Well, because alcohol was now illegal, suddenly all of those clubs that were surface level clubs, clubs that everybody knew about, those clubs uh, started losing business because what fun is it when there's no alcohol for everybody to get drunk? Well, when these main clubs or well-known clubs started to lose business, other people started so-called called speakeasies, which were underground hush-hush clubs that would sell illegal alcohol. So if everybody knew about it or if it was public knowledge, the police could come at any time and bust these clubs. Well, since these clubs were already underground and immoral and illegal, it was easy to allow certain performers that would have been cast as immoral or illegal because the whole thing was underground and illegal anyway. So again, it was in these speakeasies, this is where Gladys Bennett along with some of the other popular lesbians, this is where they got their fame in these speakeasies. And let me cut in right here for a second because I don't want to make it seem like she wasn't making any surface club appearances at all. She definitely was. But it would be like sporadic tours where she would go and suddenly appear in all of these upscale clubs. But it was only because their patrons were like interested in her because she was something different. She was something for the moment. Like even when we talk about the celebrities we just named, Barbara Stanwyck, uh, Cary Grant, all of them. Yes, Gladys did perform in front of them. But see, a lot of them were at the speak easy as a matter of fact all three of them were rumored to be uh, bisexual or just straight gay themselves so these people were actually at the speakeasy they were sitting up there uh, trying to get drunk and do crazy stuff too but even so like I said she did have some performances at uh, upscale surface level clubs and not only that she also cut and sold many records but her main crowd and the place where she was accepted and the place that she worked steadily were definitely the the speakeasies. And even then, that doesn't mean that these were just like Rudy Poo joints. A lot of these speakeasies like almost equal the uh, upscale clubs. So don't get it twisted. They weren't like juke joints or nothing like that. However, they were still speakeasies and they were still illegal. Well, here's the tee hee hee that y'all been looking for. Close to the mid 1930s, prohibition in. Now alcohol is legal again. So now all of these surface level popular clubs have opened back up because now they're able to sell alcohol. And these clubs are where the majority of the public go. Well, at these surface level clubs, people started to feel like the things that Gladys was doing was wrong. They started to feel like her dressing like a man was wrong. Some of the laws were even starting to change. 
Now, I think it had even got to the point where Gladys Bentley had to uh, produce a license to be able to dress like she dressed. And basically put down that her style of dress, you know, these top hats, these suits, and all this kind of stuff, were just a part of her show. So her career started to nosedive, especially in the city of New York. In fact, it got so bad in New York that Gladys ended up leaving for a little bit and going to California. There she tried to hit up the gay spots there, but for some odd reason, the gay crowd in California just wasn't feeling Gladys like that. And baby, the folks say soon her new boo was new through. Child, they said that woman cut out and left Gladys real quick. But as these things were caving in on her, she stuck to her guns. She was a lesbian woman and she liked to wear men's clothes. And as the 1940s came around, she spoke out about just how much she was sticking to her guns. You know what I'm saying? This is what she liked to do. She was not changing for anyone. And then when the 1950s came around, Gladys was posing in Ebony Magazine newly married to a man walking around with a doggone dress on child. Yes, you heard me right. The great cross-dressing performer was definitely in a magazine wearing a dress saying that she had just married a man. And if you're confused, Think about how confused the people were who knew her back then. Folks were sitting up there scratching their head. But as they started to read the article, Gladys told them what happened. And to sum it up, she basically said that she first started wearing male clothes in elementary because she wanted to emulate her brothers. Because her brothers were the ones who got all of the love and affections from her parents, especially her mother. She also said that she had now figured out that this was the reason that she she hated her brothers. Her mother didn't reject them. So Gladys said the trauma of her mother doing this is what caused her to uh, become lesbian, to become gay. This is what caused her to have these feelings of hatred for males. And since she could not develop an attraction for males, the only other thing for her to do was to develop an attraction for females. So this had to be the reason why she was attracted to her uh, elementary school teacher. She also went on to say that while she was performing wearing men's clothes she was tortured she said she knew in her heart that what she was doing was wrong but as her career started to wind down Gladys said that she was ready for a change she was tired of that lifestyle and at the same time that she was having these feelings of wanting to change her lifestyle a man named Don started to come to every single performance he would even stay after the club closed just sitting down talking to Gladys she said that she told Don you know I date women this is what I do and Don basically said you know I understand but maybe you should just give me a chance well one night um, they ended up getting so close that they ended up kissing Gladys became so uncomfortable and so full of despair that she actually started crying not only did she start crying Don started crying and I guess he might have started crying because he figured I'm never gonna be able to get this woman but Gladys of course started crying because you know she just couldn't get on with it you know either way it goes though she was determined to live her life like a female after this and so uh she said something about calling Dunn a few days later and telling him you know she wanted to marry him well per her words she did end up marrying Dunn but I guess their marriage was over within like two months but she said that even though her marriage to him did not last it opened up some sort of feminine mentality or something inside of her. She wanted to continue being a woman. So she ended up going at it full force. She started back going to the doctor and she told them that she was ready to turn back into a woman. And she told them to just do whatever they had to offer. And so they did have some sort of operation to offer her. And basically what this consisted of is um, I think her getting about six estrogen or female hormone shots per month. She probably got these shots for about three months. And shortly after this, Gladys swore up and down she was cured, honey. She felt like a dainty little barely touched girl. Oh, she just wanted to smell every flower. Wanted to wear every dress she saw. Just wanted to buy all of the necklaces in the world. She was just so feminine that she even wanted to get married again. And so she married a guy named JT Gibson. And this was the guy that she was married to while she was doing this um, Ebony interview. So while she was telling people her story in the spread, this was the guy, JT Gibson. This was her current husband. Well, maybe JT didn't know about Gladys' past life as a lesbian entertainer or something. 
Because baby, after she did this Ebony interview, JT Gibson went around telling anybody who would listen, Gladys Bentley, I'm not married to her, I would never marry her, I don't know what she was talking about. Like kinda denying her, kinda putting her down almost. Well baby, I guess he put her down one too many times because uh, not even six months later, he was getting put down all the way down like six feet under the ground because gossip claims out of nowhere this man ended up suffering an uh internal hemorrhage and dying and he was only like 35 years old and whether they were married or not gladys's mourning period did not last very long probably about two weeks after this she was married to a new guy this guy's name was charles roberts and he was a 28 year old cook she and charles took all of these wedding pictures and you know they were featured in the magazine and they even went on a honeymoon to mexico and then their story together just kind of disappears out of the limelight. Nobody knows if their marriage worked or not. And if you ask, several people will tell you that they don't believe the marriage worked at all. In fact, these people believe that deep down in Gladys Bentley's heart, she didn't even want to be heterosexual. They feel like the only reason all of this heterosexual stuff started in the first place was because of something called McCarthyism. Now McCarthyism was something that started in the late 1940s, early 1950s. And this was when all type of people, celebrities and normal people, were being accused of being communists, especially black entertainers and performers. All type of celebrities, white and black, went from being box office draws uh, actors and actresses to being like nobody instantly because the government accused them of being a communist. Everything got ripped from them. Well, along with this McCarthyism, something else started and this was called the Lavender Scare. And this is when almost everybody was suspected of being homosexual. And if you were found to be homosexual, the government automatically accused you of being a communist. So suddenly you had homosexual entertainers as well as homosexual government workers as well as normal homosexual people that were stripped of everything, all of their belongings, and sometimes even detained. And Gladys Bentley being the de facto lesbian performer, it was like, hey, the target's on my back, come get me. And so this is why people feel like right at the start of the 1940s, Gladys Bentley was like so gung-ho about being lesbian, you know what I'm saying, I'm a cross-dresser, all this kind of stuff. Then at the end of the 1940s, she started to see a whole bunch of her friends have everything taken from them her tail started uh singing a different tune she got scared so per this theory or this rumor this is why she suddenly started wearing dresses and trying to force herself to date men and even though she started doing that this still would not have been enough to deter the government if they really wanted to get her. They would have easily said, oh, she just faking, you know what I'm saying? She thinks she can act like she's straight just by slapping on a dress and dating probably one of her doggone gay male best friends. So Gladys definitely would have had to step her game up. She would have had to let the whole world know that, hey, I'm also taking these treatments, you know what I'm saying? I'm getting a procedure done. Like I am really turned into a woman. I am a woman now. Everything about me is a woman. But I can't lie, this theory actually makes a lot of sense. And I would be happy to honestly just go along with this theory, but there is something that throws a huge monkey wrench into this theory. And that is this, in the late 1950s, about six years after she did that Ebony Magazine article, or six years after she turned into a heterosexual woman, Gladys started to get heavy in religion. She was so deep in it that she wanted to start her own ministry. As a matter of fact, a lot of rumors say that she actually was acting as an ordained minister. Although she hadn't submitted any paperwork or anything like that, she was still acting as an ordained minister and preaching in different places. So since this was the case, maybe that throws the whole McCarthyism theory out of the window. Maybe Gladys didn't turn into a heterosexual woman because of McCarthyism and because she was scared. Maybe she turned into a uh, heterosexual woman because she really did want to change. Maybe she did it for religious reasons. Then again though, who knows? Because she acted as an ordained minister. Back in those time in the 1950s, the only people who were ministers were men. It was pretty much unheard of for a female to be a minister back in that time. So who knows? Maybe she was back to acting in a masculine vein. 
I want you all to put in the comments your opinion, what you think or what your theory is because I really, really want to read what you guys think. But I can tell you that at the end of the year of 1959, Gladys Bentley came down with the Asian flu. But what she didn't know is that she didn't have the flu at all. She'd actually had pneumonia. Gladys didn't know this, so she died unexpectedly on January the 18th, 1960 at the very young age of 52 years old. And y'all, just to add on a little bit to her story, when I was researching her and I saw the ebony column that she did or the ebony spread, well, after they published that, they did a response column of people who could write in. And y'all, I can't even lie, it was absolutely heartbreaking to see these people writing in saying, you know, I'm suffering from the same thing. I'm also attracted to the same sex. I'm not a bad person. I don't try to force myself onto anybody. So it was just crazy to see all of these people battling with these feelings and trying to explain themselves and it was just weird. It was it was just crazy to see. But anyways, guys, if you guys enjoyed this video, go ahead and click the like and subscribe button. This has been the old Hollywood scandalous tale of Miss Gladys Bentley. Please tell me your thoughts and opinions in the comments. Y'all have got to start back leaving comments for me, honey. Now, everybody knows this channel is accepting of all opinions. You don't have to agree with me. Heck, you ain't got to agree with nobody on this doggone channel. I still want to see the way you feel about things because I'm a debater at heart. No, I probably won't get up under your comment and start debating with you, but still, I can debate with your comment uh, behind the scenes. Now, this don't mean get up under here leaving me all kind of nasty comments talking about something I'm a bald-headed bee. That ain't what I'm talking about. I'm just saying, you know, share your thoughts. But anyways, this is the end. Like the video, subscribe. I will see you guys next time. Bye.